am Lily. Today I'm going to read the story King Arthur. Is it King Arthur? It's King Arthur. Reading out of the 4A. King Arthur. Okay, let's read it. The story of how Arthur became king. Once upon a time, a thousand years before Columbus discovered America, and when Rome was still the greatest city in the world, there lived a brave and handsome youth whose name was Arthur. His home was in England, near London, and he lived near the good knight Sir Hector, whom he called he always called father. They dwelt in a gray square castle of gray stone with a round tower at each corner. It was built around a country yard and was surrounded by a moat across which was a drawbridge that could be raised or lowered. When it was raised, the castle was practically a little island and very hard for enemies to attack. On one side of the moat was the large forest, and here Arthur spent a great deal of his time. He liked to lie under the trees and gaze up at the blue of the sky. All about him were rocks, stood giant guardians, watching sternly over the soil where they had grown to centuries. Arthur could look between the trunks and see rabbits and squirrels whisking about, sometimes a herd of brown deer with, sh with shy dark eyes would pass, holding their holding their graceful heads high in the air, sometimes a flood of pheasants with brilliant plumage rose from the bushes. Sometimes there was no sign except the cabin of the bright-crested woodpecker, and no motion the fluttering of leaves and the trembling of violets half, half buried in grass moss. At time, when it was dim and solemn in the wood, Arthur would hear bursts of merry laughter, the tinkling of bells and the jingling of spurs. Then he would know that knights and ladies were riding down the road which ran beside the trees. Soon the knights would appear on horses, or to like to watch them flashing by, still armor with wrapping of crimson and gold and blue and rose-colored. Better still, he liked to see the pretty, happy faces of the ladies and hear their sweet voices. In those troubled times, however, the roads were so insecure that such companies did not often pass. But Arthur did not spend all his time dreaming in the woods or gazing at knights and ladies. For many hours of the day, he practiced fits or worms in the country yard. It was the, it was the custom of it. Uh, in England to train boys of no birth to be knights. As soon as they were old enough, they were taught to ride. And later on, they lived much among the ladies and maidens, learning gentle manners. Under the care of the knights, they learned to hunt it, to carry a lance properly, and to use a sword. And having gained this skill, they were made scoreless if they had shown themselves to be good of character. Then day by day, the scores practiced at the acquainting. It was the upright post on the top of the which turned a cross piece, have on the, have on the end brow of board, and on the other back of sand, the object was to ride up and fold the lap, strike, strike the board with the long lance, and get away without being hit by the sand, sand back. Besides this, the squirrels had services to do the four knights in order that they would not learn to be useful as many ways as possible and to be always humble. For instance, they took care of the armor of the knights, carried the letters and messages for them accompanied and justings and the tournaments. Being ready with extra weapons or assistance, and in the castle they had to serve the guests at table. After months of such service, they went through a beautiful ceremony and, and remained knights. In the country round that Arthur of all the scores was the famous for his skill in the use of a lance and a sword, for his keenness in the hunt, and for his country seat to all people. Now at this time there was no ruler in England. The powerful author of Wales, Wales, who had governed England, was dead, and all the strong lords of the country were struggling to be king in his place. This gave rise a bit, great deal of scoring and bloodshed. There was in the land 
a wise magician named Merlin. He was so old that his beard was white as snow, but his eyes were as clear as a little child's. He was very sorry to see what a fine old day that was going on, because he feared that it would do serious harm to the kingdom. <coughs> In those days, the great and good man who ruled the church had power over must take work of the giant monarch. The kings and the great lords listened to their advice and gave them much land and money for themselves for the poor. So Marlene went to the archbishop of Canterbury. The churchman who lived in all England was a man they loved and said, Sir, it is my advice that you send all the great lords of the realm and bid they come to London by Christmas to choose a king. The Archbishop did a Merlin advice, and at Christmas, all the great lords came to London. The largest church in the city stood not far from the north bank of the Thames. As the church was surrounded, it filled with ye trees, the trunk of which were knotted with age. The powerful lords rode up in their clanking armor to the gate, where they dismounted, and giving their horses into the care of this course, we reverently enter under the church. There were so many of them that they quite filled the nave and inside the ills of the building. The good archbishop looked at their stern brown faces, they, their heavy beards, their broad shoulders, and their glaring armor, and prayed God to make the best man in the land king. They began service. At the close of the first prayer, some of the knights looked out of the window, and there in the churchyard he saw a great square stone. In the middle of him was an anvil of steel a foot high, and fixed therein a beautiful sword. On the sword was something written, and writing said in red gold, which said, Whosoever pulls his sword out of this stone, and the anvil is the real king of war England. After the service was over, the lords went into the churchyard. They each pulled at the sword, but none could stir it. The king is not here, said the archbishop, but God will make him known. Meantime, let ten good gods, good knights, keep, keep watch over the sword. The knights were soon chosen, and then the archbishop and the head was fixed day. Every day, a man in the kingdom should try to pull the sword out of the anvil. He ordered that on New Year's Day, all the people should be brought together for a great tournament to be held on the south bank of the Thames. The London Bridge, after a few days spent in jesting among the knights, which man should make the trial to find out whether or not he was to be king. The brave young Arthur did not know the contest that he was made to restore the sword. Sir Hector told him that there that they were to go to a tournament, but did not tell him the reason for holding the tournament. So Arthur rode to London with Sir, with Sir Hector and Sir Kay, who was Sir Hector's oldest son. Sir Hector and Sir Kay were slowly in front. They were tall, stern-looking men and rode black horses. There were dark figures making shadows and the lights snowed and fallen. Arthur, riding behind them, felt exhilarated by the crisp winter air, which caused which caused the blood to dance in his veins. Sometimes he stood up in his saddle and flipped with his bull to dead leaves on the ox.